Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Let us be known, let us be known by the way we love. Let us be known, let us be known by the way Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Love. The greatest commandment is love. You know, if you just listen to that song, that would be enough, and we could go forward, maybe. Um, Jesus said that that commandment sums up all the law and the prophets. And then when he gave his final instructions to his disciples, he included this sentiment. He called them to love one another, and in so doing, all would know that we are his. Love. Our calling is to love. I'm so thankful um, to be here with you, and I'm thankful to be able to share this with you. As I was asked to come and, and to speak on this topic, which is a really weighty topic, I felt so inadequate and so um, un able to speak into it because it is so weighty and so large. There are so many things that the youth of today are experiencing and hearing. Um, there are so many very um, difficult things that are going on. And to even broach one of the messages that they're hearing could take months and months to cover in depth. And so as I was asked, I thought, Oh my, who am I? How am I going to share in one evening, in 20 minutes, um, with you all about coming alongside our youth and um, speaking into the things that they're facing? And so as I prayed and thought about it and prayed and thought about it, <laughs> the Lord brought this to me. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. Love, that's all we need. Like I said, I'm, I'm no expert, but I have spent some time um, on campus with uh, the youth on college campuses, especially Eau Claire here. Um, I've spent time walking alongside my own children, um, and I've listened to them and heard the stories and engage with them about the things that they've been hearing and receiving um, 
from society and from their peers and on and on. What I'd like to know is what are some of the messages that you are hearing as you are interacting with youth that you are connected to, whether it be family members or neighbors or friends, what are some of the things that they are saying or mentioning in terms of messages that they are hearing from the world that are causing them to really wrestle and struggle um, as they hear these messages? And you can just shout them out. What are some of the things that you know that youth that you know are grappling with and struggling with? Identity issues, yes. Mm -hmm. Whether it be sexual identity or gender identity or there are a number of others as well. Um, other things that you've been hearing or noticing as you've engaged with different people that you know, youth that you know. Well, some that I've been in, <laughs> exposed to or have heard about, um, have recognized, happiness above all is a message. It was need to be happy all the time. Everything needs to be happy, including our posts all need to be happy. And we need to be liked, and we need to be noticed, and we need to be followed. Got to have a lot of followers and a lot of likes. There are expectations they get to be pretty heavy about our life trajectory, about how we approach life. And then there's inclusion or exclusion. And who do we include? And who do we exclude? And then justice issues that arise. And how do we address those? And how do we approach those? And we have a whole bunch of ideas that are thrown at us of how to do that. But how do I go and navigate that myself? And on and on. There are more. Um, those are just a few. And then what I've noticed is the fruits that those messages bring about. As students and youth grab, uh, grapple with those messages, there's fear. There's desperation for control, trying to figure out a way forward that feels comfortable, that feels safe. Um, there's anxiety depression, canceling, or isolation, just trying to push everything outside that you don't want to hear about out of your life so that you don't have to think about it anymore. And then as was brought up, the struggles with identity, who am I? So how can we come alongside? Um, how can we be of help with so many different messages with so many really complicating stories that, we are, that our youth are hearing and experiencing in their lives. It is definitely worth taking some time and reading and learning, finding books that speak into the subjects that you know people that you are connected with are dealing with. It's definitely worth investigating and learning more. But what I was moved by the Lord to bring to you tonight wasn't a bunch of expert stories and, and illustrations, um, but was Jesus himself. His wisdom and his example, because he showed us a way of engaging with people who are very different from ourselves, people whose ideas and ideologies are very different from our own, because as he walked the earth, he himself engaged with people who were very different than himself, and who were very different even from the, from the mainstream religious people of that time. Paul calls this way that Jesus exemplified in his life the most excellent way, love. Love is the most excellent way. And then he takes the whole of chapter 13 in 1 Corinthians to try to describe love because this word love is packed. It's weighty and it's full. It's not just a feeling. It's not just an emotion. It's not just a sentiment. It's very large. 
In fact, the word used for love to describe God's love in Hebrew is hesed. And that word, when tried to be uh, translated into English, it takes a lot of other words to try to capture it, and it doesn't do it justice even still. Um, Michael Card wrote a book uh, a while back, and he titled it Inexpressible. And in it, he explores this word hesed. But in one of the first few pages, he lists a lot of the different English words that have been used to try to capture what God's love is. And I'll just read a few of them. There are a lot of them, as you can see. (laughs) And this doesn't even probably capture all of them. Loving kindness, merciful, generous, loyal, kind, compassionate, devoted, covenantal. As you hear these different words, you get to a sense of a picture that it's not, it's not one thing, but it's a way. And as we look at the life of Christ, we see that way lived out. We see his compassion and his grace. We see his mercy. We see his um, loyalty to the Father. We see and hear so many teachings that display all of those different things that I named and more. So as we consider how to come alongside someone All we need to do is look to Jesus. And something that I've been learning recently as I have read a book that I have a number of books on the back table, um, and they all kind of talk about a little bit of the nuances in terms of following God and engaging with other people. Um, One of them, though, is called The Other Half of Church. And in that book, it talks about how we have been created by God in our brains to receive and to engage with others, um, how we've been created to be relational. But it also in there, it talks about how through our experiences of love and through our witnessing examples of love, we learn what it is to love. Um, It's not so much through a talk, and it's not through reading about it but it's when we see it lived out in another person, when we experience it ourselves, we learn in so much, in such a deeper way and in such a more impactful way. Um, so I wish that I could like act out love here before you, um, but I, I refer to Christ and his example because in that we read about what he was like, we read about how he engaged with other people. And so as we meditate on that example, we will learn and we will grow. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, he summed up our calling in love, and then he lived it out. He taught it and he exemplified it. He said when asked, what's the greatest commandment? He said it was to love the Lord our God with all of our being and then love our neighbor as ourselves. And then as he was asked, well, what, who is our neighbor? Well, he expanded on that. And what did he use? He used an enemy. He used the Samaritan man to exemplify loving a neighbor. Someone whom the Jewish people hated was used as the hero in the story of the Good Samaritan. And we hear in that story a picture of that sacrificial love that we see Christ exhibit. We hear in that story someone willing to cross into, um, into a very different space with a person who is very different from themselves but was in need. And he came to them and he cared for them in a way that those who were a part of his culture avoided. And so we see this beautiful and crazy and amazing picture in that. And if we really think about and meditate on what that is like, if we think about that example that was put before us, we can learn the heart of God. We can learn what his love is like. We can learn that his love is one that looks and sees a person in need 
and seeks to care for them at cost. Now, not only did Jesus tell stories about it, he acted it out, he lived it, right? And he lived it even in an example um, for us, another example with a Samaritan. He comes, uh, or he, he takes a path, and I love it because, and I'm going to read it, because it's just, it just kind of makes me chuckle. Um, so it's the story of the good Samaritan, or excuse me, the story of the woman at the well, um, the Samaritan woman, which is in John 4. And here's what it says. Now he had to go through Samaria. He had to go through Samaria. Um, I, I, I chuckle at that because every other Jewish person took the long route around Samaria to avoid it. But Jesus, he had to go through Samaria. So he came to the town in Samaria called Sychar. Near Jacob's well, he sat down. And that was when the Samaritan woman came to draw water. And he engaged a conversation with her. Here we see Jesus crossing a number of boundaries. (laughs) Not only is he talking to a Samaritan who was hated by the Jews, but he's talking to a woman who at that time would not have been esteemed very much at all. Um, And not only was he talking to a woman from an enemy culture and people group. He was talking to a woman in an enemy culture and people group who had had many husbands, who was drawing water at the wrong time of day because she was avoiding her own people who scorned her. So I don't know how many, but at least four. (laughs) Four things that Jesus is crossing to engage with this woman another picture of love is a willingness to talk to those whom others took the long road to avoid. And I love the engagement with that woman. That, I mean, that would be fun to just spend a whole evening on in itself. It's a good story. Now, Jesus, there are a number of other interactions um, I really appreciate uh, all of them, (laughs) but there's one in particular that also stands out, and that's when a group of um, people bring before Jesus this woman who is caught in adultery, and she's about to be stoned, which was part of Jewish law, uh, and they are asking Jesus about that. And Jesus just draws in the sand, which, okay, that's another thing I'd like to be able to ask more of why he's doing that exactly. But he poses to them, he who is without sin cast the first stone. And one by one they drop their stones and they leave until it's just he and the woman. And then what does he say to her? He doesn't chastise her. He doesn't condemn her. In fact, he says, I don't condemn you either. Go and sin no more. He shows her love. He shows her compassion. He does speak truth, but he does so in a way for her best and for her good. Um, And that is only after he's done an amazing demonstration of love towards her. There are more examples. I encourage you to, to look into the Gospels and see them. See them as the examples of love that they are and take time to meditate on them. Try to place yourself in the scene. Try to picture what was happening and learn from his example. Receive the teaching he has for you in the way that he lived. Now, he also taught, um, he spoke. Like I said, he answered the, the one teacher of the law who wanted to know what's the greatest commandment. And then through his great sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, There are a number of places where he speaks to how to come alongside and love another, love a neighbor. He talks about reconciling and settling matters peacefully. He talks about turning the other cheek. He talks about going the extra mile. And he talks about giving generously. So once again, if we look at the Sermon on the Mount with the lens of how is it that Christ is teaching us about how to love others, there's so much there. 
the one that you may have thought I was going to mention, which I am, um, that he says in the Sermon on the Mount is one that has always been convicting, but now I find great, um, it's been a great gift, a great gift for healing. And that comes from chapter 5 um, in Matthew, kind of in the middle of the sermon, and starting at verse, verse 43. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Just take that in. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Even if you start thinking about the events of this last year and all of the enemies that you are labeled as enemies as you thought about those people and you know we use that word those people to set them apart from us but as we think about that Christ is calling us to love them and to pray for those who persecute us not to pray judgment and condemnation on them but to pray for them I'm reminded of um, a story that came out, a news story, uh, after a school, and I'm forgetting of the country, and I'm so sorry, because um, I'm just thinking of this now, and I didn't have it in my notes, um, but there was a school in Africa that there was a, a group of militants that came in and just wreaked havoc. They killed many people. And then later, um, it was reported that some of the students there they were praying for those that came in and did the attack. They were praying for their salvation. They were praying that they would come to know and repent, but they were praying for their good. They were loving their enemy through that prayer, these people who had just come in and killed so many of them. Just so striking. Jesus goes on to say, to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be called children of your Father in heaven. Why would that be? Because our Father in heaven loves. It goes on to say, He causes, our Father in heaven causes, His Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are you not even, or sorry, are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect or complete, mature, whole, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Loving our enemies and praying for those who persecute us. He taught us about love, and he showed us as he walked from place to place, calling those who were enemies, like Matthew the tax collector, to be his disciples, and caring for those that others condemned, those cast off from society because of their illness or because of their disfigurement or because of their deeds. So many, many demonstrations. He saw people. He looked them in the eye, which is such a life-giving gesture. I don't know how many of you experienced this as you came into this room and as you greeted people and they greeted you back with a brightening of their eyes and a smile on their face. And what did that produce within you? Did you feel that joy well up inside you? That is the joy that the Lord has for us to give us life and give us strength. I don't know how many of you have heard this or learned this, but this was also in that other half of church book. And it talked about how as babies, right, in order for babies to thrive, they need someone to look at them with love and joy, with smile, and they need that, that face to face, that, that looking in on them. If they don't have that, they don't thrive. Well, guess what? The same is true for us. <laughs> we need that. 
We need someone to see us and to smile. We need someone to look at us and to acknowledge that they're delighted to be with us. We need that. And the Lord Jesus gave that to those that he engaged with. He looked at them in the eye. He listened. He asked questions. He shared words, and he also shared meals, which in that culture, even more so than our culture, demonstrated a desire to do life with them, to bring them into your life, to join with them in a deep communion. It's a beautiful thing. And he touched them. He touched the lepers. He touched the unclean. So many expressions of love he demonstrated. And then, of course, his greatest act of love, dying on the cross, freeing us from the curse of death, and giving us life, life eternal with him. What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul, as the song says. So how do we love? How do we follow Christ's teaching and example? Well, we look to what he did. We see and we recognize how he came alongside others, his interactions with others. We recognize that he enters into conversation, listening, asking questions, willing to learn, willing to hear. And those that others would condemn, he touches and is gracious towards. He does speak truth, but in love and for the good of the one he's speaking to. This is how we come alongside others, listening, learning, touching, sharing words of truth in love, but listening. There's a diagram that I'm going to have Cindy pass out now. And Erin, you can put it up on the screen. Bringing a little bit of my university background to you. Um, this diagram is something that was created for helping those who are going to go and do some sort of short-term missions. So it's designed for crossing cultures. What I've discovered in my, um, in my work with InterVarsity and walking alongside students is there are many times when we are crossing cultures right here. So I have shared this with students who are having roommate difficulties. I have shared this with students who are um, about to be getting married and they're recognizing that their spouse, their soon-to-be spouse's family culture is very different than their own. And so they, too, are crossing cultures, even though they're just getting married. Um, and so there are a number of times when we are engaging with another who is very different from ourselves. And I found that this can be a very helpful thing to think about and reflect on. And as I was looking at it, even again uh, in preparation for this to share it with you, with you, I recognized Jesus in the green path. So I'm just going to walk through this so you can understand uh, what this diagram is revealing. Um, and then I'm going to uh, share an example, a story from my ministry on campus years back. So like I showed, or said, there's, there's a green path. And then there's a red path, and you might recognize the green path's a good path and the red path's not quite so good. <laughs> but both of these paths are true. They represent reality. And so don't take it as shame, but just recognize that this is, this is potentially how you will approach things and then engage with the Lord in prayer to help you to be able to maybe turn from things that aren't as helpful and be able to turn towards things that would be helpful. So the first column, the approach, how we personally enter into a situation. We can enter in with openness and acceptance of the other. We can trust and have adaptability or flexibility as we enter in. Or we can have suspicion 
and fear take over us. And then we can act superior and have prejudice towards the one that we come in contact with. So there are two different groups of descriptions there. There may be other things that could have been listed. But the idea is that there are two different ways that we can enter into a, um, a time with someone else who is different from us. Now, as we enter into a relationship with, with someone or some people who are different than we are, there are some inevitable things that come up. And this is the second con um, set. And you notice it's all together. Because no matter what, thing, what way you've entered in, we all experience some of this. Um, when there are differences, we experience a dissonance inside us. We experience an unease. Uh, we experience uh, the things that are listed there in terms of we experience frustration, misunderstanding, confusion, tension, embarrassment, and maybe even aggression. I know when we uh, took a short-term trip to Mexico uh, many years ago, uh, I found myself just feeling really weary and irritated, and I couldn't figure out why exactly, but it was because I was always in this place of dissonance, and it was a hard place to remain. It was a hard place to be, and that's a good place to be with the Lord and to talk to him about it, to share these things that are coming up inside you and to ha ask for his help to respond in ways that will be helpful and not hurtful. So we do respond, um, and we can either respond more similarly to Christ's example with observing and then inquiring, listening, and initiating. And I can't help but think about the woman at the well when I think of these, because that's exactly what Jesus did. He's sitting there by the well, and the first thing he does is he observes. He observes, A, this woman is coming at the wrong time of day, B, this woman is coming to get water from the well. Hmm. There is an opportunity here to be able to speak into this. Um, so he observes, he inquires, he asks a question. And it's not even a probing question. It's just, will you give me some water? <laughs> you know? Um, and then he listens and he continues to initiate with her. So that's one that's the maybe more positive way of being able to respond. But we can also find ourselves responding in that lower, in the red path. Um, we can find ourselves criticizing. And we can find ourselves rationalizing. And then we can find ourselves just desiring to isolate and stay away. If we discover these things within us, again, it's a good time to pray and to seek the Lord and to ask for his help that he would help us to grow and learn his heart and his love for the other. Like the song we sang talked about, you know, build within me your love that I can go out and express that to those around me. After we respond, there are obviously going to be results. There are going to be fruits to our response. And if we're able to respond on that green path, then we may be able to cultivate understanding and empathy and a deepening of a relationship. But if we find ourselves responding on that red path, then we'll wind up more often than not with the results of alienation, withdrawal, and broken relationships. So I appreciate this because it's, it's a picture, and I'm a visual person. <laughs> and I appreciate this because it helps me to recognize what's going on inside myself as I interact with other people. And then it gives me an avenue to be able to pray and to seek the Lord's help. So I share that with you as just a tool, something that you can maybe take with you and uh, use it to help you as you find yourself experiencing or recognizing different things stirring within you, that this can maybe be a help for you to be able to pray and seek the Lord's guidance as you're engaging with others. So the example, a number of years back, I had a student leader in university um, who I was overseeing. Uh, as university staff, we, we work to mentor and care for the leaders in the, in the group and help them in the things that they're doing on campus. 
So I was walking alongside this student, and one, one of, in one of our one-on-one -on -one, um, meetings, she shared with me her struggle. She opened up to, to me and confessed that she was struggling with her sexual identity. She didn't know if she was heterosexual, lesbian, or bisexual. And this was really hard for her. It was hard for her to share with me and, and hope that I will not reject her. Um, it was a place where she had to choose to trust, and that was a challenge. Um, it was hard for her because she believed in Jesus. Jesus was her Lord and Savior, and she was very committed to him. She loved him, and she wanted to follow him. And yet she found these things going on inside her, and it caused her to just be in disarray. And she prayed, and she sought the Lord, and she wanted to bring me in and share this with me. She knew what this would mean in terms of her leadership and, and the questions that could arise. And so there I was listening, wanting to show love, wanting to um, follow the Lord in how to speak to her and how to share with her. And I experienced some of the things that are listed there in terms of the, the dissonance. Like, oh my, what am I going to say? And oh my, I hope I don't say the wrong thing. Um, how can I communicate your love to her? How can I listen and hear? And I'm very thankful, um, thankful for her grace toward me, because I didn't say everything perfectly. <laughs> and thankful for the Lord's help in guiding me, um, that he helped me to stay more on the green path than on the red path. <laughs> but it, it took intentionality. I needed to be intentional to listen. I needed to be intentional to hear her story and to learn from her instead of put on her my story and my thoughts. I needed to hear her. I needed to let her know that, that I would listen, that she could trust me. And so I let her share. And as I felt prompted by the Lord, I shared things with her. I shared truths. I shared comfort. I shared counsel. And as we continued our journey, um, and as she continued to seek the Lord on her own, I just delighted. I delighted in watching the Lord work. I delighted in how he spoke to her through his word. I delighted in how he moved her heart to yield to him, even if it meant that she would never marry. She was willing to do that because her Lord was first, and her identity, she said, was not her sexual orientation. Her identity was a child of God. And she wanted that to be true always. And then I got to see what the Lord birthed in her in a heart for others, others with similar struggle. And she started a Bible study in that community, in a community of people wrestling with their sexual identity, with their sexual orientation, pointing them to Jesus and his word and allowing Jesus to do the good work of ministering to them as well as helping them to see his love and to know that he welcomes them as they are and help, would love to help them to walk forward with him. It was just a delight to walk alongside her. It was challenging. It was hard. I did not have all the answers. I am not that... Uh, and like learned, I have not read enough books. I don't know everything about um, orientation and how to, to speak to that, how to minister to that. But the Lord was faithful and he provided and he was at work, which is how it should be. We are not alone. <laughs> Thanks be to God. He is Emmanuel. He is with us. Whether you feel it palpably or not, the Lord Jesus is with us. He is here in this room. He is with each of us who believe. And as we go forward and seek to love others, seek to come alongside others, he is with us and he will provide. We do not enter alone. We need not feel like we're entering alone. 
He has promised to be with us. You know, we talk about the Great Commission and we remember, go make disciples, but then sometimes we forget, and I will be with you always. We're not alone. He also gave us the gift of each other. He gave us the gift of a body of believers that we can also have alongside us to support us, to pray for us, to encourage us, to remind us of what's true when we need that reminder. We are not alone. As we close our time um, today, uh, I just want to pray for you and pray for us all. Um, Pray for those that we know who we have interaction with, who are wrestling with these different messages, who are wrestling with how to live, um, who are are dealing with the fruits of that wrestling, the fears and the isolation maybe, dealing with anxiety and depression. So let me pray for you and for myself. (laughs) Thank you, Lord Jesus. You are with us. I thank you, Lord, for your example to us. I thank you that you not only told us how we should live, but you lived it for us to see, to witness through your word now, but in person back then. Help us to meditate on your example Transform our hearts and minds by your example of love. Build within us your chesed, your amazing, covenantal, faithful, gracious, merciful, wonderful, compassionate love that we might be able to bring it to those around us. Give us eyes to see those who are hurting around us and the willing heart to come alongside them with your love in all that it is, to care for them, to bring them comfort, to provide what they need. Thank you, Lord, that we do not go alone, but you are with us. Thank you in advance for how you will provide words to speak, truths to share, ways to show love. Help us to show love in our faces. Help us to show love through our hands. Help us to show love through our actions and through our words. I pray your blessing on each of us as we go forward. I pray, Lord Jesus, that in you we would find hope. In you we would stand strong. In you, we would bring love to all those that we know. In Jesus' name and for your glory, amen.